Welcome to episode 3 of the Architecture of Future Technology podcast. This is volume 1 focused on autonomous vehicles. My guest today is actually somebody who I've known for a really really long time, 23 years if my calculation is correct. Um how I met Rajiv um is an interesting story. We were uh both volunteering for an organization called Asha for Education uh when we lived in the suburbs of Chicago and uh and yeah we've done uh, a bunch of things with that organization uh at that time and uh Rajiv what I remember about Rajiv one of the things is that not only did he bring kind of empathy and compassion uh about the people that we're talking about and whose lives we wanted to improve Uh, but also brought a sense of both a vision and a sense of uh, reality especially so rajiv uh, comes from uh, the state of bihar in uh, in india and th- there are certain um, things that happen with the non profit industry in bihar and rajiv brought a very uh, realistic view to that and the rest of us were kind of naive and he brought that thinking and and really helped us improve in our uh, shall we say maturity in working in that non-profit uh, ecosystem uh, but that was you know 23 years ago the world has changed uh, and a few months ago at this point a couple of months ago i was uh, attending an autonomous vehicles or a automotive technology conference in the suburbs of detroit and i just parked my car and i looked at my rear view mirror and there goes rajiv I was like, "Whoa, what are you doing here? You were you used to live in Chicago the last I knew. Um how did you uh make it here and so on so uh that's how I met Rajiv uh, again for the second time. Uh so Rajiv, what uh, brought you to Detroit? What are you doing now? Thanks for the introduction, Prasanna. Yeah, so we we were in Chicago and uh I was uh, primarily as we were company working with Motorola, we were in uh, cellular uh industry development where we were doing 3G 4G 5G uh technology uh, and then the meltdown of telecom companies happened and then i started looking for new uh avenues and uh, uh one day i got a call from general motors that they need some help uh, with connectivity uh, domain and uh, that's how i moved to detroit in 2014 helping with the connectivity uh, improving the connectivity of uh, auto industry uh, and and since then uh, i have been uh, addressing connected vehicles uh, autonomous vehicles and certainly electrified uh, vehicles now which are the uh, three uh, big uh, domains in which auto industry is uh, uh, moving and uh, that's the future direction for uh, auto industry uh, just uh, to say that i have been associated with various uh, companies and i have been contributing uh, in thought leadership and as well as others and uh, my uh, views that i am presenting here are totally mine <laughs> not with the, not representing any company or so uh, though i'm blessed that i have Uh, work with the various industry leaders and uh, uh, i have uh, learned a lot with all of them so i'll try to put my perspective here yes absolutely you're no longer with general motors but you're still in the large uh, detroit ecosystem uh, but we can't talk about your employer at, today uh, but that's okay uh, I, i guess uh, one more thing that uh, one more story that comes to mind uh, about rajiv and kind of the reason why i asked him to come Uh, I mentioned earlier that he has a vision uh, a lot of times that is uh, ahead of what a lot of other people you know other people are able to think so this example comes you know back in the day when Rajiv and I were both in the telecom industry and um, Ra- Rajiv you saw a pattern and you tried to get people to pay attention to it what was that can you talk about that a bit uh, yeah so back in uh... year 2000 2001 i was at motorola and uh, uh, i was in the advanced technology team there and 
I, I was given a uh, responsibility uh, and, and basically uh, to lead. That time, internet was just in a very, uh, not that huge. And uh, we were still doing GPRS and uh, uh, edge technology, like 2G technology. And uh, uh, so I, I was given a thing that lead the internet applications or internet uh, domain, What how we can use it in uh, uh, mobile or the cellular industry. Uh, we did lots of work. We did an ITF. We did robust header compression because internet protocols were not very well suiting to the uh, uh, air interface and with the very narrow band that we had. So when when we were doing that, we did uh, lots of work and uh, we we started rethinking how this whole industry, uh, how this whole products or the thing will go. And very at that point, we realized our it was not only me but our team that hey we. Everything that we are doing, 100%, we could be able to uh, run on an internet uh, uh, technology. That entire tele cellular cellular telephony that we could do that. And uh, that time, it, it was not that. I mean, uh, telecom was a telecom vertical, and uh, entertainment was an entertainment vertical, and all that. So we had one one conversation with our leadership, and uh, I, I put forward that hey. As, as a long-term vision, we should think towards uh, kind of morphing our company to an internet technology company instead of a uh, just a telecom company. And uh, it was not taken in a very, uh, this thing uh, that, oh, what I'm talking about, like, you know. <laughs> uh, though we did try to put, but, but then again, that time we were playing only the application area, but uh, now, now you see that reality that uh, we are, uh, almost 100% thing is running in cloud, uh, our telecom industry. Right, absolutely. So the lesson that I learned from that story is that if you don't listen to what Rajiv has to say, then maybe not only will your company go into get into trouble, but maybe the entire industry um, can be at risk. So when... <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's, that's, that's a quite a statement. <laughs> it's really not. I think uh, uh, we, 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 yeah, certainly we, we need to talk and discuss and uh, yeah, the things takes their own time and uh, a pace to, to reach where they have to reach. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit. But uh, when we met in Detroit, I think Rajiv, you said something that because kind of, of this kind of background and having known some of these things, um, you said something that really made me kind of stop and uh, rethink this. So this podcast, this entire volume is about autonomous vehicles. And when we were talking to, uh, when I was talking to Rajiv at an at a automotive technology conference, and I said that, hey, you know what, I'm working in automotive vehicles. Rajiv says, uh, why do you need autonomous vehicles? Rajiv, you want to talk about your counter view on autonomous vehicles? Uh, yeah, I mean, right now, okay, you can see that, okay, I don't want to drive, you know, and I want to be feel safe. Uh, then take Uber, you know, there's a driver there. And uh, why? Why? If, if you don't want to drive and you feel unsafe driving, then you can give that responsibility to others, you know, and uh, uh, Uber is there and uh, other other kind of mobility options are coming. But then still, we want to be driving so so the major major thing that comes that we want to reduce uh accidents uh with autonomous driving and uh, that's a, that's a good good target and uh, a good uh, kind of technology can help in that direction and uh, we are moving into that uh, it is uh, at the first step it is uh, adas which is basically uh, we are giving aid to the uh, drivers and then slowly we can get, get it more to reach the full autonomy. But then again, this, this question kind of sometimes goes, okay, if you get a full autonomy, uh, it is uh, moving to a very different world after that, if at all we reach 100% autonomy. And that's why I, I, I sometimes uh, uh, wonder, uh, or basically let's, let's, let's discuss what, what other kind of Future where where we will end up, uh, if at all we are moving into the direction of hundred percent autonomy. Right. So uh, we'll get to that uh, future in, in one second. Uh, the, uh, one uh, more thing that uh, I think you said at that time that stuck with me is that in the immediate future, in the very short term, the value for the driver is not going to come from autonomy, but it's going to come from a couple of other things. You know, you want to talk about that a little bit. 
as, as far as like the immediate short term steps? So, so short term, definitely, I think everyone is now aware and I've been where the whole world is seeing. I mean, the, the three major movements that is happening is about electrification, uh, connectivity or connected cars and autonomous driving cars. And, and these three dimensions are taking the whole auto industry to a uh, new uh, world, a new business, a new in a, ability and a new possibilities that, that we can do from, from not only that from the technology perspective, uh, but it also from uh, how we will be consuming or, or will be mo the mobility uh, as a whole. Uh, so these three, when it comes, I think, uh, and the culmination of all these three, three things goes into what now we started talking about software defined vehicles. Uh, so the software defined vehicles essentially gets to that space where uh, definitely Electric is not to do so much with electric uh, electrification, but definitely with the connected uh, uh, ecosystem and uh, autonomous driving. Uh, so autonomous driving again can be a little bit of a tangential to that, but yeah, connected. When it comes to connected, we are wanting to have our car 100% upgradable, 100% uh, 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 what access we could give, and kind of is pushing us moving from a product domain to a service domain kind of uh, uh, a place where, where the auto might be seen more as a service than as a product. Right, absolutely. And uh, you talked about the software-defined future of the automobile. Do you think uh, car companies today are ready, well-equipped, well on their way in making this, or are there some challenges in, uh, in kind of making the transition to think about software as a core part of what uh, they do? Yeah, I think the whole industry has embraced it. That's that's there. Whether they are there, no, it is it's still in infancy. It is pretty early stages. Some companies, uh, you may say that, that they're a little bit ahead, uh, but uh, reaching a software-defined vehicle uh, target uh, is still, uh, if not nothing else, I, I think could, could minimum take a decade or more than that. Uh, it, it goes into so much uh, because uh, of our... Uh, legacy, uh, also we can say that, uh, and auto industry has been moving uh, in good uh, uh, pace with technology, and uh, every year you see that so many uh, new features that is added, you know. Uh, now, only thing is that the little bit disruptive it is going to be, we will we will see uh, major changes into, uh, or more kind of disruptive uh, things into coming. And it is also coming that our, the way we, we consumer, we have not now getting used to our lifestyle, a connected lifestyle, you know, that uh, like our entertainment and connectivity uh, on home from mobile phone to watching TV or video or looking at newspaper that has changed. And that entire thing has to move to our uh, auto space. So we, we don't want to see uh, getting, okay, if I'm in car, I can't do this or I can't go there. If, if I have to run my meeting and uh, uh, I could run my virtual meeting from the car space. So, so we, it's, it's a seamless, uh, basically experience. Uh, auto industry is to address and we are coming. And, and definitely the software defined vehicle means that we should be able to add features, we should be able to add capabilities on a uh, more uh, uh, frequent basis instead of what we bought today and we stay with that for another 10 years or 20 years. That is not going to be there. So uh, whether like it or not, auto industry has to embrace it. And uh, we are on the path, Every, everyone is uh, trying to define uh, what their own uh, timeline when they will be reaching the full scale uh, software defined vehicle. Great. So let's uh, now switch gears a little bit to what this uh, the, the name of this uh, podcast around the future. So um, talked a little bit. You know, the software defined future is still you know ten years away to get all the way there. But a little bit further in the future, when you think about autonomous vehicles and autonomy, what does that future look like to you? Uh, you know, um... autonomous vehicle. Okay, so that's that's opens up a lot of the genesis of uh, mobility came, and <laughs> you see that before uh, cars, we were running on horses, and we had multi-dimensional way of moving, go anywhere in any direction, and when we adopted this uh, basically driving, then suddenly we had to had our roads, and we we go in, in on roads, and uh, we we kind of restricted our our movement. Uh, 
because the vehicles move on the roads. Uh, but now that autonomous driving is coming and we really see that, okay, I'm, I'm not driving, but my, I'm being driven by an algorithm or, or something that, that is doing that. Uh, and we are still going in that very congested road, trying to save ourselves uh, from very millimeters and centimeters of uh, uh, maybe uh, that that could lead to a major accident, you know. And so the, the, th the thought comes that why do we limit ourselves to such a congested environment? Uh, if at all, we can free up ourselves uh, from there. And uh, so, so this autonomous driving essentially now says that, and, and then the other development that is happening uh, is that we have drones now. Uh, companies are experimenting uh, that for personal mobility could be use drones or maybe a flying cars. Because certainly uh, if you have to fly, then you learn flying and then everybody is not comfortable. Driving is much easier, so people were driving. But now if it is driven by uh, algorithm, it is driven by computers, then uh, yes, I mean, uh, that possibility comes that uh, a drone kind of a, the vehicle or, or a flying car uh, could be a possibility and it will leave us in a space which is less congested because now we have a third degree of movement uh, uh, basically uh, instead of just going in one direction and trying to save yourself colliding uh, at a millimeter centimeter but rather uh, lift up and then you open up a space to go 10 tiers 20 tiers uh, above that so so it will ease up your space so that's one possibility i see that autonomous driving takes us uh, into uh, the dimension of moving into three dimensions. Wow. So you see the fifth element uh, type of a future where, you know, Bruce Willis opens his window and then there's a taxi cab and you think, you know what, hey, there's a cab. Uh, but later you realize that it's not just a taxi cab, it's a three dimensional road and the cab is floating in the air. Um, and you're dealing with not just a two dimensional traffic jam, but a three dimensional traffic jam. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so, but I guess the, uh, so that's interesting. One question that comes to mind is, will it actually be easier for, from an autonomy AI perspective, to navigate and avoid collisions in a three-dimensional space than in on a congested, congested road? Because, um, you know, your options are quite limited. Yes, yeah, so on the three-dimensional space, we, uh, it's only that it eases you out. Not that, see, uh, when you are going out on uh, out of your home and uh, mobility, uh, there are other, uh, there are many, uh, your right of way and where you can go without eavesdropping. You just don't want to fly over somebody's backyard, you know, the privacy things and that. So there's the corridor of these roads are there. They are certainly, uh, they are public spaces and uh, they, are, they are meant for driving and uh, getting help, all those things will be there. So yes, we, we could still be using the, that public space or the roads that has been defined and we could be driving, but then if we don't have to be saving ourselves from millimeters and inches and uh, uh, of, of uh, collision and uh, slowing down ourselves so much, but rather if we can go uh, maybe 10 feet high, then it's eased up, you know, then you don't have to get into that collision. And then another high. So. It is just that opening yourself in a less congested space than to kind of uh, uh, restricting yourself in a very, very uh, small space where the two or three lanes roads are there. Yeah, that's very interesting. So you're saying that it's not just science fiction authors and fans that are thinking about flying cars, but actually car companies are exploring and experimenting in this space as well as startups. Is that right? They are, they are. I mean, you can see, go to and do your YouTube, Google, and you can find so many flying cars and so many flying drones, and they are putting an enclosure around that, that the person can sit into that, and uh, uh, they are doing lots of experiments, in fact. Yeah, there, there was one other one, I think, uh, recently in Japan, there was some sports event, and somebody came with a flying motorbike. There was a demo there. So, yes, so this space is being explored heavily, and uh, I think... Uh, it makes quite a good amount of sense that uh, we will be venturing more into uh, those, those uh, exploring our three-dimensional uh, mobility. All right. So those of us like me who are afraid of heights may have a little more challenging future than we had hoped for. Uh, but that notwithstanding, so the uh, 
there's one other shift that you see. So you talked about, you know, the uh, adding another dimension to how we drive and a little bit about the technology that goes into it. But uh, on the business side, you're seeing another shift uh, that autonomy and autonomous vehicles are going to bring about. Can you talk about that? Uh, yeah, so that's really a very uh, uh, interesting part that comes. And it's a, it's a kind of natural uh, change that we, that we see is that. So today, when we drive, uh, the drivers uh, are the liable. The liability goes to that. Everybody has to have an insurance. And uh, when it's an autonomous car, you are not on the driver's seat. And, but that you are being driven by algorithms. And you are not the decision maker. So uh, the liability aspect really brings a new dimension of how future will look like. Uh, so the, now that comes that, okay, uh, who's liable then? Is it auto companies? Because they have built the car. They're the, it's their algorithms. And uh, one auto company's car's algorithm could be different than other uh, company cars. Somebody could be more aggressive in, in certain aspects. Somebody could be less aggressive because there's no set standard there that uh, uh, there could be some laws, but again, no standard. If you go in a traffic light and uh, who moves first, you know, uh, that that decision or who breaks first. I mean, those, those things are certainly safety is the most important. Everyone tries to be safe. Uh, but still, there are uh, some of the strategies how to get out of that. So when, when it comes to that and a person is not there, then the liability uh, and all this decision making goes to the algorithm makers, which are auto companies. And uh, uh, if it is the auto company who is uh, uh, making that, then it comes that, uh, do you really want to buy that car? Because uh, the liability is, uh, what does it mean by buying a car if the liability is still with the auto company, if they are still holding the uh, insurance? So, uh, it, it might happen uh, that, uh, and it could have go naturally that auto companies will be more interested in just uh, uh, sharing, uh, giving as a as a rent or or a rent model or a basically a leasing model, uh, because ultimately if anything goes wrong, they have to address the car and they have to take back the car, and not that they have washed their hands with the car, and and that essentially opens up a totally new. Uh, business uh, scenario, totally new business enablement, and a, a different ecosystem uh, that maybe we can uh, uh, talk about uh, that. So if a car company no longer sells your car, but you're renting it and they're just you know, giving it to you temporarily, so that probably changes their eco economics and their mindset. So I, I remember a story, now I don't know for sure, but this is attributed to... Uh, to Ford, uh, Henry Ford, to be specific, that uh, you know he came into his uh, assembly line one day and asked his engineers, um, you know, which parts break down most often? Like, uh, how do they, you know, when do they break down? What is the duration of each part breaking down? And uh, and the story goes, the engineer is thinking, oh wow, you know, here's Henry Ford. He wants to make these cars last longer. And uh, Henry Ford looks at him and goes, no, I don't want to make them last longer. I want all the parts to break down around the same time so that I can sell them another car. So the, um, the model of, ha of sales is resulting in making cars that are, the car company doesn't make more money unless they sell you another one. And if the car works perfectly for 50 years, you may not buy for 50 years. So that itself, that economic incentive itself uh, will be changing, wouldn't it? Yes. Uh Definitely. So, so let me put some some more perspective onto this. You know, uh, today when you buy a car, um, majority of the time people buy the car, and uh, auto company, either rental companies or people companies, auto companies don't own them. Uh, sometimes you lease for some time, uh, but the most prevalent uh, uh, way of owning car is that people purchase car. And what happens? Uh, some cars people keep driving as a clunkers. You know. Uh, some people like to change their cars more frequently, um, but on average, you see that people between nine to 10 years, people like to retire their car, but they are not. I mean, you see that people drive their car 20 years, 30 years, sometimes, but yeah, 20 years, quite often you can see cars moving on the road. That certainly doesn't add much economics to the people, either sometimes they also do 
emissions, uh, bad emissions and all that. Uh, economically, how to address that? And again, when these cars go uh, uh, ultimately dump, it doesn't go to the recycling uh, all, the, all the way up to that 100% recycling is achieved. So lots of them go into different spaces. But you see that if the ownership of the car changes and if the auto companies remain as the owner and they are just leasing you or renting you uh, for the drive, which becomes like a now a service model. Uh, in, in that scenario, one thing is that they can get back those cars uh, or, or the vehicles as and when they want to basically recycle them. And uh, 100% recycling could be achieved. Uh, because the entire car is in their control all the time and they see the best time when to recycle them and when to bring a new fleet of vehicles on the road. Uh, so it, it brings a continuous renewal. It brings a continuous a, a 100% recycling and uh, maybe what, I don't know if something could be reused, but uh, uh, certainly recycling is definitely there. So if, if you look at it in a bigger perspective, I think, not only that, we are achieving a very bigger environmental uh, win here that we are not throwing away things into that, but rather 100% recycling is achieved. It also gives a very huge economic uh, benefit to auto companies to kind of keep renewing their fleet, keep building and bringing new technologies and keep selling more. If, if they are not selling at least, uh, keep adding more services if it, it becomes a service uh, uh, kind of a domain, uh, then uh, then definitely that that's a economic uh, benefit as well as environmental benefit. And probably we are moving to a uh, new era, which is uh, much more uh, eco-friendly than what we are today. Great. That's uh, very interesting. You're taking a bunch of different concepts from different fields from you know the software updates side of things you're looking at it from a business perspective insurance perspective autonomy perspective and the impact of that on the drivers at the business model of the of uh, the car companies and then tying all of that to a more eco-friendly way of continuing to make economic progress for the car company. So that's a very interesting integrated uh, way of thinking about it. So let's close on that um, that thought around how can we not only drive and see the world, but actually leave the world uh, in a better shape than we found it by creating cars that are fully recyclable and autonomy potentially has a role to play in getting to that future. Thank you, Thank you very much. It was a pleasure talking to you. And uh, yeah, your questions were really thought-provoking <laughs> to, to bring my, my thoughts. <laughs> Thank you.